For today's In Focus, we travel to Wiltshire and one of my favourite Neolithic long barrows, West Kennet. Located on a chalk ridge close to Silbury Hill and one and a half miles away from Avebury, it is part of a sprawling landscape, long recognised as filled with monuments and meaning. This landscape was investigated by John Aubrey in the 17th century and William Stukeley in the 18th century. He believed the significance of these monuments lay in their interconnectedness and produced a detailed plan covering an entire landscape, the so-called Avebury Serpent. In the 1600s, despite grisly stories of ghostly hounds haunting the area, West Kennet Barrow was raided by local doctor, Dr. Toop, who used bones he discovered in potions and medicines. In the 19th century, turf and chalk were removed from the mound and a farm track crossed over it. One of the chambers was excavated by Dr. John Thurnham in 1859. He removed human skulls in order to measure them, but he left no detailed records of his research. Though this was the first serious investigation of West Kennet, it is the excavation and restoration work carried out by Stuart Piggott and Richard Atkinson in 1955-56 that has resulted in the monument that we see today. West Kennet is a chambered long barrow and one of the Severn Cotswold tombs, similar to this site, Wayland Smithy. It is one of the longest barrows in Britain, totalling around 100 metres, and it is estimated that 15,000 man-hours were expended in its construction. The barrow rises gently towards its chambered end, and has the remains of quarry ditches on each side. The chambers take up approximately one-eighth of the barrow's length, and are comprised of two pairs of opposing transept chambers and a single terminal chamber. The entrance is defined by a forecourt area with a facade made of large slabs of sarsen, dense sandstone, stones, which were placed to seal the entrance. Archaeobotany has established that the long barrow was built on grassland, and construction commenced around 3600 BC, 400 years before the first stage at Stonehenge, construction of Silbury Hill, or the Avebury Henge, and it was in use until around 2500 BC. Thus, it is thought the tomb was in use for around a thousand years. Excavations within uncovered the remains of at least 36 individuals, carefully placed in the five stone chambers. Many of the bones were disarticulated, and some of the skulls and long bones were missing. Artifacts associated with these burials included Neolithic grooveware, similar to the pottery found at nearby Windmill Hill. Often they had fresh breaks, indicating they were broken on site. In the southwest, on the left as you go in, is a large sarsen stone with a smooth groove down it, possibly from polishing or sharpening stone axes, possibly to aid disarticulation and manipulation of remains. Elderly people were found in the front right-hand chamber with slightly less disarticulation. This may have been linked to how important the individual was in life. Only one skeleton was complete, an elderly man with a broken arm and an embedded flint arrowhead. These may suggest he met a violent death. Distribution of pottery shirts from various periods and people indicate the tomb was entered and re-entered many times, disturbing and mixing layers. There is some evidence for the categorization and sorting of bones into different chambers, and the missing bones indicate that they were removed for display or possibly to be transported elsewhere, each time the blocking facade removed and replaced. Towards the end of the use of the tomb, the passage and chambers were filled to the roof by early Bronze Age beaker people, who left behind shards of their famous pottery in the backfill. Along with these were pottery disturbed from other layers, charcoal, bone tools and beads. Stuart Piggott suggested it had been collected from a nearby mortuary enclosure, showing that this site was used for ritual activity long after it was used for burial. 
Animal bones, pottery and the remains of fire have all been found outside the entrance to Long Barrows. These may be the remains of rituals associated with the removal and replacement of bones. And approaching the entrance of West Kennet is an avenue of stones, indicating a prescribed route to and from the monument. West Kennet Longbarrow is unlikely to have stood alone in its significance. It is connected to and located within a landscape. In a valley to the northeast is a series of palisade enclosures, dating to between 2600 and 1800 BC. These would have been wooden, apparently linked with conspicuous consumption, life, and notable for the absence of later beaker pottery. So, what was the significance of West Kennet's Longbarrow? Firstly, and most obviously, this was a significant place, and a significant effort went into the monument's construction. Its location on the side of a hill would have made the transportation of the massive stones used in its construction a major challenge. The largest of which probably came from the Marlborough Downs, nearly seven miles to the east. And it is estimated that more than a ton of limestone was used for the chambers and the revetment work. This is likely to have come from 25 miles to the west. And of course the bank itself took a huge effort to construct. This is a space which has been defined, made into a place, the prescribed approach to the monument. The less public but still open space of the forecourt before you enter the tomb and the transition beyond a stone façade to a more restricted, smaller space within. The separation of space is the separation of knowledge and power. Within the chamber, bodies were transformed, disarticulated and sorted. Which categories guided them, and which remains were taken away is unclear, though age seems to have played a role. Why were these rites performed? It is possible that in disarticulating and moving remains around, they lost their identity and simply became those who came before, the ancestors, a mass, to be honoured and revered. The landscape is crucial in understanding such sites, for they don't exist in isolation. Just as with Stonehenge, its meaning and significance is revealed through an understanding of its context in the landscape. The enclosures close to West Kennet illustrate that this was a landscape contrasting the living and the dead, wood and stone. West Kennet was peopled by the dead in contrast to the living palisade enclosure where there is evidence of feasting. This contrast, while strong, resulted in liminal areas where the spaces blurred with prescribed routes for passing through them. And the living clearly did visit the dead in an interlinked, symbolic existence within the landscape. The meaning of the West Kennet Longbarrow probably changed over time. The insertion of beaker pottery into the Longbarrow during a filling-in event and its absence from the enclosure illustrates a changed use of the landscape. These were possibly people attempting to associate themselves with the dead, anchoring them to the landscape via places which were clearly special but whose use had shifted. West Kennet Longbarrow is a very special site and one of my favourite Neolithic monuments. It beautifully illustrates the complexity of the people who constructed it, the changing associations and nature of monuments over time, and is an excellent archaeological case study, stimulating a question for every answer it yields. For all of these reasons, I continue to be intrigued by the West Kennet Long Barrow.